Hello and welcome to the latest expert series webinar. Today's webinar is Innovations in Indexing, Constructing Global Portfolios with Smart Beta ETFs. This is a complimentary ETF.com webinar courtesy of Wisdom Tree Asset Management. I'm Ollie Ludwig, the managing editor of ETF.com. We are the leading authority on news and data about ETFs and the company behind Inside ETFs, the world's biggest ETF conference. Joining me today is Luciano Siracusano. Uh, he is Wisdom Tree's chief investment strategist and head of sales. He is the co-creator of Wisdom Tree's patented fundamentally weighted indexing methodology, and he has led the firm's sales force since 2008. Before we get started, I'd like everyone to know that you can ask questions at any time during the webinar in the window at the lower right of your screens. I'll probably be asking a few questions during Luciano's presentation, but there will be a Q&A after his presentation. Also bear in mind that Luciano's presentation will be available to all of you by early next week. As the indexing and ETF revolutions have evolved, since John Bogle of Vanguard brought the first capitalization-weighted index fund to market in the mid-1970s, and also more than 21 years after the first U.S. ETF was launched, investors have generally become much more open to the idea of indexing. At the same time, investors have become more and more disenchanted with both the relatively high fund fees, as well as the questionable track records of all but a handful of active mutual fund strategies. This doesn't mean that they've given up on the quest for outsized returns. And that's where Wisdom Tree's Luciano Siracusano and other innovators in the world of fundamentally weighted indexes, notably Rob Arnott of Research Affiliates, have discovered a blossoming opportunity in the world of investment management. By serving up methodologies that weight securities in a portfolio based on fundamental factors such as earnings and dividends, as Wisdom Tree does, Instead of just, price, just the price of securities, funds using Wisdom Tree's indexes are often able to outperform capitalization-weighted strategies. More than 200 billion U.S. ETF assets are now benchmarked as so-called smart beta indexes, including fundamentally weighted indexes like Wisdom Tree's. And a growing number of fund sponsors have woken up to this opportunity and are marketing such strategies. Those include, of course, Wisdom Tree, PowerShares, iShares, State Street Global Advisors, and even Charles Schwab. Now, Wisdom Tree's entire lineup of 69 funds is based on fundamentally, fundamentally weighted indexes, and its name in the ETF industry is now associated with the single biggest smart beta success story, the Wisdom Tree Japan Hedged Equity Fund, or DXJ, as we call it in the ETF industry. It's a fund that accesses Japanese equities by waiting for dividends, it tilts towards export-oriented companies, and of course, it neutralizes the dollar-yen currency cross. DXJ gathered about $10 billion in new assets last year, and now has just about $10 billion in assets. It's impressive to be sure, but DXJ has taken some of the attention off of Wisdom Tree's other success stories, and there are plenty of them. And it's also taken focus away from the deeper pursuit of fundamentally weighted indexing that is at the core of Wisdom Tree's business plan. A lot of folks describe fundamentally weighted indexing as value investing by another name. But whatever we call it, Wisdom Tree is now the number five U.S. ETF sponsored by assets, and it's nearly $35 billion in total assets under management is nothing to scoff at, especially since many of its funds have five years of real-world returns to keep detractors in check. On that note, I'd like to welcome Luciano Siracusano, Wisdom Tree's chief investment strategist to shed light on all of Wisdom Tree's products and its special place as the only fund company focused exclusively on fundamental indexing. Luciano? Good afternoon, Ali. Good to be here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you today. And, and what I'd like to just frame the discussion uh, today is in the, really in the context of, of building global portfolios with the so-called smart beta exchange-traded funds. You know, a lot of people are just tuning in and learning about smart beta or alternatively weighted indexes. 
um, Wisdom Tree has been a pioneer in the space, and we've been creating these alternatively weighted indexes now for <clears throat> more than eight years, and we um, have created a track record over the last eight in terms of the ETFs that are tracking those indexes. And so we obviously have a lot to bring to the table uh, in the discussion of them. Um, Ali covered a lot of the history of the company. Um, we are headquartered in New York. We have 92 employees as of the end of June. Um, but if you had to sum up what Wisdom Tree does in a, in a phrase, I would say that we are at the heart of this debate in indexing, which is raising the question, you know, is there a better way to index? That's the question we posed eight years ago. And it seems as if today people are just tuning into that, uh, to that debate. Uh, there's been a lot of press, a lot of attention around so-called smart beta indexes. And if you're just tuning in now, basically that's a kind of a middle ground between traditional passive beta exposure and traditional active exposure, where there's an active manager picking and choosing the individual securities. So I do want to talk about smart beta today, but I want to do it in the context of really what the advisor or the advisory firm's goal is in terms of how to serve clients. And I know a lot of you are out there <clears throat> either running ETF portfolios or using ETFs as part of your allocation. And obviously, a lot of the value that you add begins with the asset allocation. Um, and that can, you know, with ETFs now, span the world. ETFs can be used to get you globally diversified across many, many different asset classes. And so a lot of times the discussion begins with how are you allocated? Are you strategic um, in the sense of you know, buying and holding over full market cycles? Or do you combine that with some tactical overlays that react to what's going on in the investment uh, climate and you know, take into other considerations, including you know, technically what's going on with different equity markets? Um, a lot of the education that's happened over the last 10 years was really geared towards this kind of core and explore approach, where the idea was try to use the ETF <clears throat> tracking the beta index you know, at the lowest possible cost in the core of your portfolio to try to, in effect, get the market's return at the lowest possible cost. And the idea there was you know, in very efficient markets, it's very hard over time for the active manager to beat the index. So why not just get the indexes a return at the lowest possible costs? And that certainly served a lot of advisors well. Um, when they've tried to explore the periphery to generate alpha, they've typically used you know, active managers and combine active with passive. In some cases, they might use a tactical ETF. But the idea was make sure the core of the portfolio is getting you at least the beta return. Now, that's led to a um, debate uh, recently in terms of the indexing world, in terms of you know, what should be the index-based product that you use in the core. You, know, you used to not really have much of a choice. Everything was capitalization-weighted. But recently, with the, the advent of smart beta, you're starting to get alternatively weighted indexes that have a lot of the characteristics of traditional indexes but they're slightly different. They typically rebalance once a year, and they're typically not weighted by market value. And the question now is, can you use some of those smart beta indexes in the core of your portfolio so that you can perhaps explore the core to try to generate the alpha or the excess return in the core of your allocations instead of settling for the market cap weighted return in the core of your allocation? And so in recent months, you've seen a lot of new, quote, smart beta products come to market. And generally, they fall into two categories. You know, there's tactical strategies that are going to get you exposure to a particular investment theme. Um, and then there's more strategic exposures that, in theory, you could use in the core and hold for the next 30 years. And the question there is, are you looking to use something that gets you very broad exposure and that taps into these, uh, what we're going to discuss in a second, return premium? Or are you going to use very narrow indexes that get you exposure to the return premiums directly, but then put the, the burden on you to rebalance and to use them tactically? And we'll talk a little bit more about what they mean. But just as a starting definition on what is smart data, you know, it's a, I said it's a, it's a catchy phrase in search of an enduring definition. But, but generally, what it's trying to do is get you exposure to equity markets 
um, in a way that you're uh, trying to either generate higher returns than the market, lower risk than the market, or both by weighting by measures other than market capitalization. And certain smart beta approaches may emphasize through selection and through the weighting of the index certain factors, including small cap companies versus large cap value versus growth, in some instances momentum, quality. These are becoming what's known as return premium in the market. So, you know, when we're talking about value, for example, there's been 30 years of data that's led us to uh, realize that over time, the value part of the market has beaten the growth part of the market. I mean, a very simple way to just do that is to look at the Russell 3000 value index going back to its inception in, in 1979. It's outperformed the Russell 3000 growth index by approximately 173 basis points annualized over 35 years. And over time, you know, that makes a very big difference in total return. It's something like a total return that's 74% greater. Now, value doesn't beat growth in every year, but if you tilt towards value over growth over long time periods, the odds historically have been in your favor that you're going to outperform the broader market. Um, similar uh, observations were made in terms of size. Over long periods of time, small cap companies have generated higher returns than large companies, and there's academic research going back to the 20s to show that. If you just limit yourself to the Russell 2000 indexes, you know, the Russell 2000 value index, the small cap value index, has beaten the Russell 2000 small cap growth index by roughly 410 basis points annualized over the last 35 years. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about return premium that have existed in the market. There's been a value premium that people can identify. There's been a small cap size premium that folks have been able to identify. Um, they've also been identified more recently momentum as a factor that's been shown to generate long-term excess returns. More recently, they've been able to show that quality, quality meaning some exposure to more higher profitable companies have generated excess returns over time relative to the market. And additional research is being done on low volatility and some of these other factors. But the point is, indexes are being made now that instead of just giving you the entire market weighted by market value, they're trying to tap into these return premium, either by selecting companies because they score high on the return premium, or selecting and weighting them based on these return premium. And that's really what we mean by smart beta. And the question now for advisors is, you know, how do you use this going forward? And we always start with the basic point that the cap-weighted index may not be the optimal way to invest for the long term. It might be optimal in terms of measuring the average performance of all of the stocks in an equity market. But it might, might not be optimal from an investment perspective, meaning does it get you the highest return for the risk you're taking on? You know, back in 1990, uh, some 25 years ago, there was an article in Pension and Investments where the, the basically the head of the quantitative asset management uh, division within Goldman Sachs, Robert Jones, he was interviewed about why he thought cap-weighted indexes were flawed. And this is the quote that we're showing you here. Um, he said, you know, at any given time, um, stocks are not always fairly valued. So some are going to sell below fair value, and some are going to sell above fair value. The problem is finding out which one is which. You don't really know until you have hindsight. But in the moment, if you have a stock that is overvalued, or a sector, or a country, okay, if it has more capitalization than it would have if it sold at fair value, um, it's going to get more weight in a cap-weighted index than the undervalued stocks, sectors, or countries. And if you think about that, what it means, it means is if you think in the long term stock prices are efficient, and that the market is going to revert and mean revert to fair value, it means that an index fund is going to be a suboptimal portfolio if it's tracking a cap weighted index. Because ultimately, you're going to have to you know, have mean reversion. And if you've overweighted the more expensive stocks, that's going to hurt your returns over time. And so the key distinction between, I would say, a fundamentally weighted index and a cap weighted index is the fundamentally weighted index will reweight the market once a year based on some measure of valuation, some measure of relative value. And we think over time that can serve investors. 
that's at the core of the wisdom tree philosophy. You know, people ask us to just summarize how we're different from traditional cap-weighted indexes. Well, we're similar in the sense that we use a rules-based process that's designed to get you very broad exposure to the equity market. We're different in that we weight once a year, typically, by income either the dividends that companies pay or the earnings they generate. Hey, and Luciano, can I uh, chime in? Quick, quick question here. Yeah. Uh, that, that annual rebalancing, the reweighting, uh, there, there are some folks who say that, that that essentially is a drag on the returns of these fundamentally weighted indexes. I'm wondering if you could just address that really quickly. Uh, to what extent that is a factor? Is it, is it irrelevant? Is it overstated? How, how, how do you respond to that critique? I would say it's 180 uh, percent the reason. I mean, I'd say it's 100 percent, uh, 180 degrees the opposite. That is that the the rebalancing is the, the central core of of how the fundamentally weighted index adds value. Because you know what happens at the rebalance is you. And we're going to talk more about it in, in a few slides. But in a nutshell, you have a way of reducing the PE ratio on the whole portfolio when you re, when you reweight. Um, you also have a way of increasing, in effect, the profitability or the, the quality of the portfolio. And over time, we think that's one of the real drivers of the returns. And we're, we're going to get to that in a second. Okay. But the, the, key, the key point of a cap-weighted index is that it will never rebalance based on relative value. The only thing that will change and uh, act as kind of a self-corrective mechanism is a bear market. That's what's going to lead to very expensive stocks ending up being sold off and get lower stock prices. Uh, fundamentally weighted index is not going to look at the stock price or the market value to set the weight. In Wisdom Tree's case, we're going to weight by the aggregate earnings companies generate or by their aggregate dividends. And we're going to take a look at what that means. What does it mean to weight an equity market by earnings? Well, in the U.S., you know, if you looked at all of the companies today, there's probably more than 2,000 that actually have, have profits, that have earnings. And when you actually say, what would it look like if you weighted each company by their earnings, this is what the top 10 would look like. They're all companies that you know and get big, big weights in other indexes. But when you weight by earnings, um, you're going you're gonna to treat everyone's earnings equally. You're going to treat Apple's earnings, in effect, with a P-E ratio of 1. And you're going to treat you know, Exxon's Mobil's earnings the same way you would treat Microsoft's or Google's. There's no P-E multiple involved. And when you do that, you get a very broad exposure to the market, but you get a benefit. And, and this example here on slide 9 is an example of what happens when you take the same three stocks, A, B, and C, weight by market value. If you weight by market value in this case, company C ends up getting 60% of the weight in your $100,000 portfolio. Why? Because it has a market cap of $700 million. Okay? Even though it has a high PE, cap-weighted index is not taking into consider valuation. In an earnings-weighted index, you would look at not the market cap, but you would look at that second column, the earnings stream. How much earnings did the company generate? And company C, if it had $35 million in earnings, would only get you a 35% weight in an earnings-weighted index. The company that generated $40 million in earnings would get you the highest weight. And in this example, the company with $40 million of earnings had a PE of 5, so in effect, you're tilting the portfolio towards the lower PE stocks. This is something that we've seen happen consistently. Every time we rebalance our broad earnings weighted indexes, we end up reducing the PE ratio relative to the comparable cap weighted index. And the importance is that helps you over time you know, take advantage of relative valuation. What you pay for an equity market is one of the things that determines your long-term return. And if you can start with an advantage on valuation, we think that's, that, 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 that augurs well for future returns. So Wisdom Tree has been conducting a real-time experiment since 2007, literally weighting the U.S. equity market by earnings. So we have a broad earnings index, which we created back in February of 2007, which includes, as you can see here on the left, 2,000 stocks with a market cap of around $21 trillion. And we've been calculating this in real time now for more than seven years. And you can see the earnings weighted index, it tracks and correlates very closely to the Russell 3000. But over this period, it's beaten the Russell 3000 by about 50 basis points annualized. And it's done so with lower volatility and lower beta. And so you end up with a higher sharp ratio and a higher risk-adjusted return. So that broad index is a starting point 
for a family of earnings weighted indexes. From that, we can cut the large cap piece where we select 500 companies based on their market cap, it becomes a large cap index. We can also select a mid cap component with $2.2 trillion of underlying market cap, very broad index, and we can cut a very broad based small cap index that consists only of profitable companies. Okay? So this is what Wisdom Tree means by fundamentally weighting. Select the companies based on market cap, weight them once a year based on the earnings they generate. Now, there's another important income stream in America in addition to the earnings stream, and that is the dividend stream. It's a stream over time that's grown faster than the rate of inflation. So if you go back to 1957, we can actually measure how fast dividends on the S&P 500 have grown over time on an annualized basis. They've grown about 5.5% per year, which is faster than inflation, CPI, over that period. And they grew faster in high inflation periods in the 70s and 80s. And they grew faster in relatively low inflation periods. So that line in blue is a very important line for us. Because over time, the return on the S&P 500 or any equity market is going to be driven by three factors. One of them is the starting dividend yield. The second is the growth of aggregate dividends, which is this 5.4%. And the third is the change in valuation. Did people pay more to own that market in 2013 than they did in 1957? You know, or did they pay less? Another way to think about it is, did the P-E ratio expand over time? Or did the dividend yield decrease over time? If any of those two things happened, you would have won on changes of valuation. So we think these are the three key drivers of return over time. And Wisdom Tree indexes are designed to try to give us an advantage on at least two of those factors, two of those three. So in the case of the Wisdom Tree Dividend Index, which, which measures the returns of all of the companies in America that pay dividends, virtually all of them. There's approximately 1,400 of them with market caps above 100 million. And what happens when you weight by dividends? Well, once a year, we weight the portfolio based on the dividend per share that they're paying, each company's paying, times the shares outstanding. So in the case of Exxon, if they pay $2.52 per share in dividends, we multiply that by the common shares outstanding, $4.3 billion, and we get Exxon's contribution to the dividend stream of the United States. They contribute $11 billion of the 366 billion, which is the total, OK? And so when people say, well, what does it mean to wait by the dividend stream? You're literally waiting by the aggregate dividends companies are paying to shareholders. You're not waiting by dividend yield. You're not waiting by dividend per share. You're not waiting by a payout ratio. You're waiting by an aggregate dollar value. And the beauty of this is that it scales for the size of the firm. So if you notice, the top 10 companies here, they're all overwhelmingly large cap and mega cap companies because we're including the shares outstanding in the calculation. What have we done? We've removed stock price from the calculation. If we included stock price, you'd be waiting by market value. But when you substitute dividend per share, you're in effect waiting by the dividend capitalization. And we think this is very helpful because over time, this methodology is going to tilt the portfolio towards higher dividend yielding stocks. And when people say, well, how is this dividend index done since it's been alive? There's eight years of real time history going back to June of 06. And you can see it's beaten the Russell 3000 value by about 100 basis points per year, lower volatility, lower beta, higher Sharpe ratio. It slightly lagged the Russell 3000, but don't forget, this is a period where growth beat value. So if we're getting very close to the market's return with lower risk than the market and a higher Sharpe ratio, that's a pretty good performance for this period. And again, this is derived from all the companies in America that pay dividends that are common stocks or REITs. And we have the ability, because we start with $17 trillion of market cap, to cut a large cap index from it, where we select the companies based on their market cap, a mid cap index selected based on market cap, and a small cap index. Again, small cap companies that pay dividends selected on their market cap weighted by dividends. Okay, So this is just a starting point of how you create a dividend weighted and an earnings weighted index. Now, when 
people ask us, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you tilting this way? Well, we're obviously trying to tap into the value premium because we think it's existed. Now, the value premium over time um, can range in terms of the differentials. In this example, we're actually looking at how did the highest dividend yielding stocks in the S&P, okay, the companies in the, in the top quintile, how did they perform over time versus the lowest dividend yielding stocks? And you can see the differential in annualized returns there is about 340 basis points a year over time. And in effect, the top two quintiles beat the S&P 500 if you have the discipline every year to rebalance into them. So we think, you know, there's different factors that you can use to access a premium. And you could use price to book would be one, low PE could be another, high dividend yield could be a third. And we think this works very well because it gets us exposure to value premium, but it also gets us a portfolio over time that's going to have a higher dividend yield than the rest of the market. And what this chart is designed to show you on page 15 is, you know, what actually happens when you weight by dividends? Where does the portfolio's weight tilt? So what this is saying is, you know, if you look at the top quartile of dividend yielders today, companies with dividend yields greater than 3.1%. In, in our index, you know, the Broad Wizentry Dividend Index, 32% uh, of our weight in the index is in companies with yields north of 3.1. And when you compare that to the Russell and the S&P 500, they're about 15%. Another way to think about it is the top two quartiles for Wizentry, we have about 75% of the weight of our portfolio, a little north of that. Basically, in stocks, with dividend yields higher than 2%. And today, the Russell, you know, 3,000 yields about 1.8. The S&P is about 1.9. So what does this mean? It means relative to the market, more of our weight is tilted towards higher yielders, and less of our weight is in low-yielding stocks or non-dividend yielding stocks. And we think over time that makes a difference because we think over time there's an advantage to be having uh, tilting the portfolio towards higher yielding stocks. But again, these are not higher yielding stocks that, you know, have a market cap of $300 million or, or necessarily have a high dividend yield uh, because they're value trap stocks. Um, they, the, the, the tilt towards the yield is happening because of the way we weight. And companies who are growing their dividends over time will tend to get bigger and bigger weights in our portfolio. So we think it's a very effective way uh, to both get higher yield and to tap the value premium. And people sometimes ask us, you know, why does starting dividend yield matter? Well, starting dividend yield can help protect you from emerging bubbles. Um, some people who are efficient market theorists think it's impossible for bubbles to happen because stock prices are always efficient. Well, if you go back to Japan in 1989, they were at the top of a bubble. In orange, you can see there the dividend yield in Japan, the MSCI Japan index, was 0.45%, about a half a percent dividend yield. That meant that the, the world was paying about 200 times to own Japan's dividend stream. Okay? What did Japan do for the next 25 years or so? Well, it returned a negative 0.44%. It was the worst performing developed or any equity market that we know of over that period. And that's what happens when you deflate out of a bubble. And the important thing is because Japan was such a big part of IFA in 1989, it was a majority of IFA's weight, it actually impacted the returns of IFA for the next 25 years. Now, if you were running a, an ETF model in 1989, you know, you would have been buying into IFA, and Japan would have been a ball and chain around your neck. It would have been a very big exposure with a very high risk. Now, if you go back to 1970, what's interesting is the dividend yield in Japan in 1970 was over 5%. And so there, you're only paying about 20 times for Japan's dividend stream. And over the next uh, 44 years or so, the Japan equity market returned almost 10% a year. So this is just an example of why the starting dividend yield is so important. And in a cap-weighted index in 1989, you would have been way overweight Japan relative to a dividend-weighted index. Dividend-weighted index would have been underweight Japan in 1989. Uh, would have been overweight Japan in 1970. So this is an example of why relative valuation matters. 
Okay. Lucha, so before, before you push yeah. on, a quick question. There was, there was a, an audience uh, question that just came in. I wanted to just address it because it was very topical. The returns that you were showing up, uh, 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 the Russell 2000, 3000 uh, growth versus value, uh, the, uh, are all those numbers that you put up uh, on those slides uh, net of expenses, or, or are they straight sort of indexes without, without the, the, the various frictions uh, in, a, in a real yeah. fund uh, wrapper? All of the index returns that we're showing you and that we're um, speaking of, these are all these are all index returns that don't include any expenses. Okay, they're just theoretical index returns without any without accounting for expense ratios. At the very back of the presentation, we're going to show you Wisdom Tree ETFs that track our indexes and what the returns have been after expenses. Okay, and after all the transaction costs and the frictional costs. But all of these and, and benchmarks, relative to uh, to other ETFs that that would be uh, comparable to benchmark against, I presume. Well, we're not showing other ETFs in our presentation. Um, we're only going to show Wisdom Tree ETFs. But the point on the index side is that the index comparisons are apples to apples. There's no deduction for expenses for the capitated index, and there's no deduction for expenses for the Wisdom Tree indexes. Okay. Got it. Got it. Thank you. So. You know, people say, well, what does this look like when you apply this around the world? What does it look like in the developed world? What does it look like in the emerging markets? Well, it's interesting, in the developed world, <clears throat> something like 97% of the weight in EFA is in dividend-paying securities, okay? So you could take those dividend-paying securities and start with a very broad representative universe of the developed world, almost $20 trillion of market cap, some 2,300 stocks. But when you weight them once a year based on the dividends they've paid, okay, converted into dollars once a year, you can see from the chart the return goes up relative to the comparable cap-weighted index. There's about 120, uh, excuse me, 112 basis points of excess return, comparable volatility in beta, and then you end up with a higher risk-adjusted return. So the Wisdom Tree GIFA index is essentially dividend-weighted, you know, EFA market. And so this is an interesting starting point for people who are saying, well, you know, how did the dividend-paying part of the uh, developed world perform? On the, on, on the U.S. side, the broad dividend index for the U.S. is really the benchmark for saying, how did all the dividend payers in the U.S. perform? And that's important. If you're an, if you're, if you're an advisor and you have a dividend fund or an equity income fund, you should know how they did relative to just owning all the dividend stocks in that market. And DFA does that for you. It tells you how did all the dividend stocks perform if you waited once a year based on the dividends they paid to shareholders. And again, you can create a large cap, a mid cap, and a small cap piece from that universe. So this is going to be helpful when you're thinking about how to allocate by size around the world. Um, in emerging markets, we saw an even greater differential. And again, the more inefficient the market, the better we think the fundamentally weighted approach can do. It's taking advantage of pricing inefficiencies. And here in emerging markets, people don't think of dividend payers, but again, about 95% of the MSCI Emerging Market Index, 95% of its weight is in dividend paying stocks. So when you take those stocks and you weight by dividends, you have a very broad based portfolio to work with. And there, we've seen over the last seven years, uh, the differentials are almost 200 basis points a year of excess return. But the volatility has been lower, as well as been the beta. So this is a broad-based index that we calculate. We also create two subsets of it, an equity income portion, which is selecting companies because they have high yields, and a small cap piece, which is selecting companies because they have small market capitalizations. Okay. When we um, <clears throat> take a look at the emerging market small cap segment, this is a great uh, asset class because it gets you completion in emerging markets. Most of the broad-based emerging market indexes are overwhelmingly large cap, and they tend to tilt towards certain sectors that are tied to global economic growth. The small cap piece typically will have more exposure to consumer staples, consumer discretionary, to the emerging consumer, what's going on a little bit more on the ground in terms of local economies. So more and more advisors are starting to use emerging market small cap as an asset class to get completion in their emerging market exposure. 
And here, Wisdom Tree was the first firm to launch an emerging market small cap ETF. We launched it back in 2007. It tracks this index, the small cap emerging market dividend index. And here you can see annualized over the last seven years, it's been able to beat the cap weighted beta by about 300 basis points per year, lower volatility, higher Sharpe ratio, um, lower beta. So you know these are broad based indexes that you can use uh, to get exposure around the world um, through the ETFs to track them. And again, developed world, same thing, first ones to launch international small cap. Again, most of the, the developed world indexes are overwhelmingly large cap. When you look at the small cap piece, you start to get different country exposures, and you can actually get some diversification benefits by adding it into the portfolio. And here, on the wisdom tree side, we've beaten the cap weighted beta by about 150 bips annualized over time, comparable volatility of the lower beta. And again, um, we've seen these funds grow to become billion dollar funds around the world. So they certainly have a lot of people who are using them. Now, taking a step back to the US, when people say, um, where has it worked best in the United States? Again, it's a function of the most inefficient asset class. So in terms of size, mid cap and small cap is where we've seen the greatest outperformance over long periods of time. And this is interesting because these are um, 600 or so profitable mid cap companies weighted by earnings have beaten the S&P 400 uh, by more than 150 basis points annualized now since inception. And this is one of the hardest indexes to beat. This index, the S&P 400, if you just go back on this particular graph to the far right, <clears throat> since March of 07, the S&P 400 has beaten 90% of all of the active managers in Morningstar's database that Morningstar characterizes as mid-blend managers, open-end fund managers. So that's a tough index to beat, but EZM, which is our fund tracking the, the mid-cap earnings weighted index, has beaten the S&P 400. This is the fund now, after expenses and transaction costs, has beaten by 150 basis points, and it's beaten 97% of all of the uh, of peer group which is predominantly active managers, but it also includes other ETFs as well. And this goes back to the first point, which is you can use these smart beta ETFs as an alternative to active managers. Sometimes you have a great active manager, but they close for new investors because they've come up against investment capacity constraints. Sometimes the manager leaves, he goes, joins a hedge fund, and the performance goes downhill. Or sometimes the performance just isn't what it should be, and you want to sell it. Uh, you can use the smart beta ETFs instead of using the active manager. Because when you use them in the ETF structure, you're typically going to be able to reduce your management fee, and you get to take advantage of the, the tax efficiency of the structure. Most of the ETFs that WisdomTree has, virtually all of them on the equity side, have never had a capital gain distribution because of the tax efficiency of the ETF structure. And so when we compare mid-caps and we take a look at small caps, you know, we're seeing our funds rank not just way ahead of the comparable cap weighted index, uh, and you can see here our small cap earnings index has done very well versus the Russell 2000, but when we compare them to the universe of what you could be buying out there, this particular fund, the ticker is EES from Wisdom Tree, small cap earnings, in, uh, earnings ETF, has beaten 91% of its peer group since inception. Okay, and that includes roughly 455 active managers and other ETFs that have a, a track record going back to March 2007. So I think these two slides help answer some of the question, well, can a fund tracking these indexes get the return of the index after fees, after expenses? Um, and I think we've been able to demonstrate we've been able to do that pretty efficiently. Now. Earlier, we showed you a slide from Professor Siegel that spoke to the importance of dividend yield over time. Another way to access the value premium is to rank stocks based on their P-E ratios. And in this example, going back to 1957, you can see that the lowest P-E quintile, the S&P 500, has generated excess returns over time that have been more than 500 basis points higher annualized than the highest P-E stocks within the S&P 500 going back to 1957. So we think sorting by low PE, 
or weighting my earnings and tilting the portfolio towards lower PE stocks is a way to tap into the value premium and a way to generate excess returns over time. So we think that, uh, you know, particularly when we weight by earnings, we are, we are doing something fairly unique in the space. We're actually weighting the market once a year and tilting the portfolio here in blue towards the lower PE stocks. And that's what happens when you reweight by earnings. Um, the S&P 600, excuse me, and the Russell 2000, if you go to the far right side, you know, have significant portions of their portfolios in companies that don't have profits. The Russell 2000 is about 20% invested with companies with no profits or negative earnings. You know, Wisdom Tree at the annual rebalance will be zero on that every year because we delete companies if they're unprofitable at the annual rebalance. And then we weight by earnings, the weight tilts typically towards those two lower PE quartiles. And the net result of that is we think we end up with a relative advantage on valuation. So these are PE ratios as of June. And you can see in each and every case, the PE for the wisdom tree portfolio is lower than the comparable cap weighted index. And we think that's important. And, 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 and I would stress that we're getting these lower PE ratios without limiting ourselves to just, quote, value stocks. When you actually look at the portfolio, they include blend stocks, and they include stocks that would normally be characterized as growth stocks. So this is really a way of owning the market, but owning it at a more reasonable price. There's some great questions flowing in. We're going to save them uh, to the end and, and address a few of them. Let me just finish up with a, key, a few key points, because one of the critiques of fundamentally weighted indexes is that really all they are is a size bet or a value bet in disguise. And Wisdom Tree has run regressions of our indexes against basically, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the academic database that would determine whether or not you're making a size or a value bet. And what we've determined here is that in the case of the earnings family, um, the mid-cap earnings index is not really making any value bet relative to the S&P. Um, the S&P 500 and the Wisdom Tree Earnings 500 score the same in terms of just having a very tiny positive tilt towards the value factor. The only place it really seems to be happening is with the small cap earnings index. It has a little bit more of a value tilt than the Russell 2000. Um, when we look at the returns over the last five years and since inception, you know, one of the things that stands out is that this is a period going back to 2007 where growth beat value. Okay? In each instance, the growth cut beat the value cut of the market. So if fundamentally weighted was a value index in disguise, you wouldn't expect it to be able to beat the market in every case, but we did. The earnings index beat the S&P 500. Um, earnings 500 beat the S&P 500. Uh, Mid-cap earnings beat the S&P 400, and it beat the growth cut of the S&P. And small cap earnings not only beat the Russell 2000, it beat the growth cut of the Russell 2000. I mean, this is really interesting because what this is saying is there's probably another return premium that our indexes are tapping into that the rest of the world, you know, either hasn't quite identified yet or hasn't given enough, us enough credit for for reaching. And if I had to, you know, um, say where I think it's occurring. I would say I think it has to do with profitability. I think it has to do with quality. Every time we rebalance the earnings indexes, we reduce the PE ratio, but we also raise the return on equity, the ROE. And we think over time that's very important. If you can have a quality advantage over the market and a valuation advantage over the market, those are two very powerful factors to combine into one index. And again, we're doing that just by reweighting based on earnings. We're not selecting companies because we think they're cheap, and we're not selecting companies because we think they have high return on equity. We're selecting all the companies that are profitable and then weighting once a year by earnings, and those are the results we're getting. When we ran regressions on the dividend family, yes, we definitely saw a value tilt to the dividend indexes. In fact, we think they capture the value factor really, really efficiently. 
um, they may be capturing it more efficiently than traditional value indexes. Again, uh, when you weight by market cap, you might be diluting the power of the value premium because a market cap index over time will tilt towards growth stocks over value stocks. It'll tilt towards large over small. And at the top of a bubble, it may even tilt towards more speculative companies or junk over quality. So there might be something inherent in cap weighting that actually dilutes the return premium. Once you switch away from cap weighting to other weighting mechanisms, you might be able to more efficiently capture these return premium. And that's what Wisdom Tree is trying to do. We're trying to capture it through how we weight. I'm going to um, pause here and just give us some time to, to answer some of the questions that come through. But you know, earlier there was a question, what are the expense ratios on these funds? What do they look like after fees and transaction costs? And so you, know, you can see you know, since inception, the Wisdom Tree fund return versus the Wisdom Tree index return. Um, what's interesting, you know, a lot of people think a small cap fund won't be able to capture the return of a small cap index over time. In the US, it's tracked really, really closely uh, within four basis points since inception. And our mid-cap fund, actually, since inception, has actually been able to, to slightly outperform the index over time. Um, and so we think we've developed a pretty good track record of, of efficiently tracking our own indexes. Ali, why don't I open it up for some questions, both from you and from the audience. And I know some have come in through email, and uh, maybe we can start taking a crack at a few of those. That's great. No, thanks, uh, Luciano. That, that, was, uh, that was great, really informative. Certainly a lot of questions. And I would say, if I were to characterize uh, one category of questions, there, there's a certain amount of doubt out there. Um, let me just start with one. Uh, all these returns you're showing, uh, as impressive as they look at first blush, uh, they all reflect an environment of l lowering long-term uh, uh, interest rates. In other words, the secular uh, bull market in bonds. Uh, that is uh, the context in which these, these really uh, attractive returns are occurring. Uh, how do you regard the opposite, which is to say the secular bear market in bonds that everyone's talking about, about to start? What would these fund returns look like in that environment with this, these fundamentally weighted indexes? How w are they likely to perform? Well, it's a great question. Um, interest rates always matter. You know, I think we can point to 2013 as a good example. You had an unexpected backup in rates in the middle of the year, um, and we had explosive upside movement in stocks. So the U.S. earnings-weighted family did very well last year. They actually, in the mid-cap and small-cap space, um, materially beat the cap-weighted indexes in a, in a, in a momentum-driven market. Um, as expected, the dividend-weighted uh, indexes lag the market in 2013. Um, they don't typically get 100% of the market's upside um, in a big up year. Um, but we have seen, you know, over market cycles, uh, what they lose in the up market, they typically make up in the down market. Um, in 2008, in emerging markets, you know, we, we had about 16 percentage points of downside protection relative to the cap-weighted index. So I would say that generally, if you were using a narrow-based dividend index, which was overweight utilities and telecom, and was you know and didn't have exposure to the other sectors, that is not a portfolio that that's positioned well to deal with a rising rate environment. That's not what happens when you own all the dividend pairs and you weight by dividends, especially now with more and more tech companies paying dividends. Um, when you actually look at the sector weights, you know. They're, they're not that far removed from where the market is. Uh, they're a little bit more defensive, but it's not as if you have a 10% underweight to, te to technology. Um, so I would actually feel that you know, in a rising rate environment, you're probably going to want to tilt towards higher quality companies um, and companies that have a little bit less leverage. Uh, I think the earnings family will work very well in that environment. Um, and I would, you know, and I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not shy about how the dividend family would work either. Um, so you know, that's an important point, but we'll see what comes. Now, I think one one uh, concern out there is that let's just say everyone and their brother piled into these fundamentally weighted indexes, there would be something like uh, uh, factor fatigue, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, how how would uh, returns be affected if this really 
grew really popular. I think we may have seen a little bit of that with the dividend uh, funds in 2012 and 2013, that they began to lag a little bit as people really got, got very trendy. And I'm wondering if you might comment in a, in a more general sense with regards to factors, if, uh, if, if, if there is factor fatigue, it's a real possibility out there. Well, I would just preface it by reminding everyone how much is a benchmark to cap weighted indexes. So there's trillions benchmarked cap weighted, and you know, tens of billions, if we're lucky, a hundred, hundred billion benchmarked to the fundamentally weighted. So we still have a ways to go before you get to any kind of you know homeostasis there. Um, the second point is, yeah, if everyone starts buying the same high yielding dividend stocks, that can drive up the uh, you know, the, the, um, the premium you're paying to get the higher yielders. And we would say, um, in that case, you probably want to be um, careful if you're buying just a high yield portfolio. Now, the nice thing about owning all the dividend payers is you also get the part of the portfolio which is, you know, focused on the dividend growers. There are some companies that are growing their dividends faster than the market um, that the market hasn't rewarded yet with higher PE ratios. So we actually are able to capture both of that. You know, over time, dividend growth is very important, um, and it's you know, dividend yield is very important. The nice thing about owning all of them is you're going to be able to capture both of them. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about people overpaying, because if they do overpay for a particular sector, when we rebalance, we have an ability to tilt away from that sector, and we have. You know, we were probably overweight utilities after 2011 when utilities had a big run. At our rebalance, we rebalance back to where the dividends were. And when we do that, we typically move away from the more expensive sectors and countries. Got it. Now, you talked a, a moment ago about the, the weakness of a capitalization weighted indexes, index in a, in a market that is a bear market or bull market, excuse me, that has really run uh, for a while. Uh, you know, you talked about speculative stocks suddenly coming into focus and getting uh, 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 pumped up in value. What does the fundamentally weighted indexes look like uh, in a market that is, you know, long in the tooth? I mean, March 2009 is now an, is more than five years ago, and there is a fair amount of talk out there that this bull market may be, you know, uh, if not uh, about to end, but, you know, certainly toward the end of it. Uh, what does a fundamentally weighted index look like in a market that is toppy? Well, I mean, if it's broad-based, it's going to have some of the characteristics of a market, you know, that's in the, the later stages of an expansion. Um, but again, I think this slide shows you there's a mechanism in the index to rebalance once a year. So you do have a way of reducing the overall P ratio on the market. I mean, this slide is showing you the Russell 2000 trading at 27 times earnings on June 30th. In order for the Russell's PE, to go to 17, okay, the Russell is going to have to decline in value, or the underlying companies in the Russell are going to have to start generating earnings much faster. One of those two things has to happen in order for its PE to go to 17. Our PE gets lowered at the annual rebalance just by rebalancing. So there's a mechanism in the fundamentally weighted index to rebalance the market for you so that you don't have to make the decision, should I sell small cap now because it's expensive, maybe generate a capital gain distribution, and then have to worry about re-entering the small cap space. Um, Do, would, uh, would the returns get better if you did more rebalancing, or is there a, a, a sort of a diminishing returns uh, issue that would be front and center in that sort of consideration? Well, if you did too much rebalancing, you're going you're gonna to run up the transaction costs and the turnover, and that could have impacts you know, on the front in terms of frictional cost. And you also, if you rebalance quarterly, you don't give yourself a chance to take advantage of a big momentum movement in the market, you know, like we had last year in 2013. Um, certainly on the earnings weighted side, we want to take advantage of that and participate in it to the extent we can. And then at the end of the year, we rebalance. Now, we might miss some of the tail end of the momentum-based movement, but we reduced valuations as well so that when people sold momentum in March and April, um, we had already exited some of those positions. Not all of them, just reduced weights, and then rebalanced back to where the earnings are. So I would say generally we looked at different multiples, semi-annually, monthly, quarterly, annually worked best for us. Got it. Now, you talked about uh, this is 
fundamentally weighted indexing uh, as an alternative to to active management. Uh, certainly, that's a that's a theme that's that's in sharp focus. If anything, everything you're doing is 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 sort of uh, making the whole question of active versus passive a, a little bit more complex. Part of me thinks, wow, if you are extracting these factors in a systematic manner. Uh, What's the case for active at this point? I mean, you even made the case about like emerging markets saying the inefficiencies are, are, are going to play to the strength of the fundamentally weighted indexing. And I've heard the same argument from active managers. I mean, why even do active? I mean, it, sound, it seems like there's a real uh, question worth asking at this point, especially net of fund fees. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason to do active is there are some great active managers. They're, they're, they're hard to find in advance. They're easy to find in, in hindsight, but they do exist. Um, and they can add value to a portfolio, particularly during the down cycle, not just because they can hold cash, uh, but they can be more selective in terms of what they're going into. So I wouldn't be absolutist and say you'd never want to use an active manager. Um, we have actively managed ETFs on the fixed income side that utilize a great institutional manager, Western Asset Management. And I think you want to use an active manager, particularly in fixed income credit, in a rising interest rate environment. So I think it depends on the market environment. It obviously depends on the manager. But on average, most active managers are going to have a very hard time beating these indexes. You know, one of the comments was, well, did you beat the index after fee, after expenses? I mean, a good example is I'm just going to highlight DTD here, okay? Expense ratio is 28 basis points. So this is tracking the Wisdom Tree Dividend Index, which, remember, is basically the beta for the dividend paying part of the market. That index returned 20% per year over the last five years, okay? It beat the S&P 500 by 120 basis points per year. If you own a equity income actively managed mutual fund or a dividend fund from an active manager, look at the returns over the last five years. If they're not compounding at 20% per year, you're really you're not really serving the client. Some of them are huge funds, and they're at 18%, 16%, 15%, 12%. I mean, some of them have materially underperformed owning all the dividend payers. Um, so this is a great starting point just in terms of your evaluation process. Now, the nice thing about DTD was you know, it actually got you the lion's share of that index return. Um, and it did so, you know, the index had lower volatility than the rest of the market. So I think you can make a pretty strong case that it's doing you know, what it was set up to do. Um, but you know, there's always exceptions. But uh, I think on balance, it's very hard uh, for the active managers in aggregate uh, to beat these indexes. Thank you very much, Luciano. It looks like we're running up against uh, the, uh, the deadline here. Uh, there are a number of questions that have been unanswered, uh, but I wanted everyone to know that uh, uh, those of you whose questions were unanswered, will uh, you'll be hearing from uh, Wisdom Tree to, uh, to get your, uh, your queries answered. Uh, that concludes our expert series webinar on innovations in indexing constructing global portfolios with smart ETFs. Uh, Luciano, thanks for uh, spending the time uh, today. Uh, and I also want to thank the audience for attending and for some interesting questions, which, as I said a moment ago, will be answered by Wisdom Tree going forward. This presentation will be available to all of you uh, by early next week, and uh, you will all receive instructions on how to obtain it in an e email. Um, so on that note, uh, on behalf of Luciano, of Wisdom Tree Asset Management, as well as my colleagues here at ETF.com. I'm Ollie Ludwig, wishing you all a very pleasant afternoon.